the possibility now of Trump, Donald Trump, becoming president as opposed to Hillary Clinton, that's very problematical for me. Um, they're both historically uh, two people who have the lowest favorables I think in the history of elections and the only reason why um, Trump may end up as a president is because people hate Hillary so much and that's scary because if I say I feel one is the lesser of two evils, people who don't like Hillary will take issue with me, but since it's my perspective, my personal point of view that I'm going to elaborate on, I, I, I fear Donald Trump more than I fear Hillary Clinton. And I think it's important that someone like Donald Trump gets nowhere near the White House. Well, we've, we, well, what, what is the charisma? What is the appeal? I mean, I, you know, I'm still struggling to understand. Like, I, you know, it was entertaining for a while watching the debates and everything, but it seems like no matter what he does or says, he just gets more and more popular. Yeah, here's what's happening. I don't think Donald Trump wants to be the president. I don't think he expected to be in the position he's in. And every time he's tried to say something that would get him knocked out, that would have knocked out anyone else, it only <laughs> made him more popular. In fact, having not spent any money, relatively speaking, that other candidates, I mean, it was a 15 other people he had to go, or 16 other candidates he went to, no, season. I think it was 17 16 talented, or 17. 17 talented uh, competitors. So-called politicians. And who comes out on top? Donald Trump. And the reason for that is, without spending any money, remember early on, when he first got into this, they wanted to blame his success on the media. And the reason why they want to blame the media, they said, look, you gave him all of this free publicity because it was all about ratings. He was a ratings juggernaut. And as a consequence of those ratings, his cult of personality and this so-called thing where people feel he's authentic, he's speaking the truth. What Trump has exposed is that the Republican Party is more about doing things that make sense, C-E-N-T-S, than makes sense, S-E-N-S-E. -E. And that's because the Republican Party is more about politics over people. And I say this because anytime you're supposed to be a person of integrity, talking about Paul Ryan, who's, if anything happened to the president or the vice president, you know who would become president of the United States? Paul Ryan. Anytime you can say, despite Trump saying something that's racist, I'm still going to support him because he's better than Hillary Clinton. I can't see you as a person of integrity. And I know Paul Ryan, and Paul Ryan scares me more than Donald Trump. And the reason why Donald Trump is where he's at, if we relate it to film, 
I think there's some films pe people need to see that point to the danger of why Donald Trump is so important with his cult of personality. Now listen to me, you hicks. Yeah, you're hicks too, and they fooled you a thousand times just like they fooled me. But this time I'm going to fool somebody. I'm going to stay in this race. I'm on my own and I'm out for blood. Now listen to me, you hicks. Listen to me and lift up your eyes and look at God's blessed and unfly blown truth. And this is the truth. You're a hick. And nobody ever helped a hick but a hick himself. All right, listen to me, listen to me. I'm the hick they were going to use to split the hick vote. But I'm standing right here now on my hind legs. Even a dog can learn to do that. Take the, the film All the King's Men, which was based on Huey Long. Um, Broderick Crawford played the part, 1949. Here's someone, because of his personality, he became the, what, the um, governor of Louisiana, and strictly on his charisma, you know, someone who really wasn't um, a so-called politician, sound familiar? But because of his charisma and people believed in him, he just ended up a king, so to speak, you know, politically. And I think people should see that film. I'll sing your song. When I went east to Sarah Lawrence, that's a college, I majored in music. And I learned that the real American music comes from the bottom up. When George Gershwin played it in New York, it was black tie music. But the real beginning of it was when folks who never owned a tie. Now, I just bumped into a fella you never heard of, name of Rhodes. Hey, what's your first name? Oh, Jack or Mac, what's the difference? Calls himself Lonesome Rhodes. Lonesome? You can go to 1957, and we have um, a face in the crowd, which is also similar to um, a story of a personality like Trump, someone who became very popular through the medium of television, and people got caught up in his cult of personality, and there was it looks like no end to where this person could could uh, wind up being so popular until a mic was left on and we really heard what was in this person's heart. Uh, I guess people at that time didn't think it could happen. It can happen. It can happen. Uh, and has happened at times. <clears throat> it might be happening now. Who knows? Who knows? But uh, this was a regular, just an interesting, energetic guy at the beginning, a free kind of a man. and. Uh, he, he discovered radio, and then he discovered television, and then he became accepted by people, and he became their folk hero. And then he, he started to manipulate them and tell them how to think, and they would do what he said do. And then he began to realize how much power he really had, and he started to, to influence the politicians, and he was about to launch <clears throat> this real loser into political office. When, uh, <clears throat> when the country discovered him by uh, means of Patricia Neal, who played a role called Marsha, she left the audio switch open at, the end, of the, at the end of a show, at the end of a program, and the people actually heard what he said, and he called them sheep, and he called them uh, that, they, that, 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 that they would do exactly what he, what he said do and how dumb and stupid they were. Then they turned him off, but mm -hmm. he took that. But that's a film, if people see it, they could see some similarities. Uh, to what we're seeing in Donald Trump. When you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. <laughs> Whatever you want. Grab him by the <laughs> I can do anything. To fully flesh out my concerns about a Donald Trump, um, when I hear so many people defending everything he says and, and, and does, I think about uh, my response is they're ready to drink the Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. well, what, what's that a reference to? Well, when I say they're ready to drink the Kool-Aid, it's in reference to the sway, the power, the command, the reverence people had for a man named Jim Jones.
Nobody joins a cult. Nobody joins something they think is going to hurt them. People of all color, different parts of the world, they hung on every word. They believed him. He was a godlike figure. Some people see a great deal of God in my body. They see Christ in me, a hope of glory. He said, if you see me as your friend, I'll be your friend. As you see me as your father, I'll be your father. He said, if you see me as your God, I'll be your God. He had this society in Guyana, and it got to a point where he prepared them for their death. They, they didn't realize it, but he had this Kool-Aid that he was going to give them as part of a ritual, and it was poison. Come to the children. Come to the pavilion. Everybody come to the pavilion. Bring your families. Let's all come to the pavilion for one final moment together. Huh. Sounds like Dad wants us to have another one of his loyalty tests. And as a consequence of people's unquestioning faith in a human being to the part to the point where they revere him so much, they're willing to listen to everything he, he says. Over 900 people died the day they drank the Kool-Aid. I'm telling you, you have got to move. You got to move, you got to move. Y'all gotta move. Now you people who are standing there in the aisles, you get back behind this table, and then back Mother, mother, please. If you knew what was ahead of you, if you knew what was ahead of you, you'd be glad to be stepping over. There are a number of films about uh, what happened in Jonestown, uh, um, the Guyana tragedy and others, but there's a very good documentary by Stanley Nelson called Jonestown. I recommend people see that. These are people who work hard but no longer have a voice. I am your voice. What scares me about Donald Trump is, is as I said before, the, 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 how a lot of people are attracted to him, and, and, and I feel for the wrong reason. Um, we have, sadly, a lot of people at this point in time who don't feel that this country belongs to them anymore or they no longer have a certain place in this society anymore you know the you know anytime you see people who are ready to support someone who's talking about building a wall restricting people of, of uh, Muslim faith from coming in, people who, who um, feel that their jobs have been lost because of outsiders. That's something um, that happens when the economy isn't working for everyone. So it's easy to start scapegoating. And when you have a person who comes along and is willing to play to those fears, that's very dangerous. So, a rich little man with white hair died. What has that got to do with the price of rice, right? And why is that woe to us? Because you people and 62 million other Americans are listening to me right now because less than 3% of you people read books. Because less than 15% of you read newspapers. Because the only truth you know is what you get over this tube. Right now, there is a whole, an entire generation that never knew anything that didn't come out of this tube. This tube is the gospel, the ultimate revelation. This tube can make or break presidents, popes, 
Prime Minister says, this tube is the most awesome goddamn force in the whole godless world. And woe is us if it ever falls into the hands of the wrong people. And that's why woe is us that Edward George Ruddy died. You have to listen to what is called dog whistle and code. And many people will tell you when they hear Donald Trump say, we have to make America great again, many people feel is what he's saying, we have to make America white again. There are 3.3 million Muslims in the United States, and I'm one of them. You've mentioned working with Muslim nations, but with Islamophobia on the rise, how will you help people like me deal with the consequences of being labeled as a threat to the country after the election is over? Mr. Trump, you're first. Well, you're right about Islamophobia, and that's a shame. But one thing we have to do is we have to make sure that because there is a problem. I mean, whether we like it or not, and we can be very politically correct, but whether we like it or not, there is a problem. And we have to be sure that Muslims come in and report when they see something going on. When they see hatred going on, they have to report it. As an example, in San Bernardino. Someone like Trump scares me because it's playing on racial politics. It may be the elephant in the room, and a lot of people don't want to see it that way, but it's, it's racial politics. It's uh, Donald Trump, his whole campaign is about bigotry. It's about hatred. Watching a rally and seeing black men struck by whites and the police handcuff the black guys and they leave the white guy who struck the, the black guy, that's crazy. And not until it made the news did it go back to get the white guy who struck the black guy. And when you see the violence and, and, and the, oh, the, the invectives that are hurled at these rallies, he's engendering hatred and bigotry. Um, um, and, and this is what's scary. So the, the thing is, we have to pay attention. It's scary. People need to pay attention. Um, yes, you can hate Hillary, but... Donald Trump is scary. See these films. You'll see why I, I feel he's, he's scary. The thing that may undermine him is the one good thing about him, and that's this. The reason why I say a Paul Ryan is, is more frightening than Donald Trump, Donald Trump is exposing his bigotry. He says he's not a politician. To me, that means he hasn't learned what a politician does. They learn the art of equivocation. They learn of the way of hiding what they really feel. That's what Paul Ryan is. Paul Ryan has said he doesn't care what people think. It's about what he thinks. Paul Ryan is an Ayn Rand acolyte. And if you know anything about Ayn Rand, she's all about, her, her philosophy was all about the individual. In, in human terms in your novel Atlas Shrugged. And let me start by quoting from a review of this novel Atlas Shrugged that appeared in Newsweek. It said that you are out to destroy almost every edifice in the contemporary American way of life, our Judeo-Christian religion, our modified government-regulated capitalism, our rule by the majority will. Other reviews have said that you scorn churches and the concept of God. Are these accurate criticisms? Uh, yes. I agree with the facts, but not the estimates of this criticism. And someone like Paul Ryan and too many of the other Republicans, they don't care about people. It's politics over people. And the reason why we have the economy and, and, and people not being able to find the jobs they need is because politics is not about compromise anymore. You know, uh, politics is about my way or the highway. Ever since Obama was elected, there was more a concern about making Obama look bad than doing the politically correct thing is to let politics be a market of ideas 
and people working out their differences and compromising and doing things that's best for the greater good, being pragmatic. All that went out the window. The day Obama was elected, the leaders of the Republican Party went into a meeting and they decided whatever we're going to do, we're going to work in unison to make sure that this man is not a success. That's how you can have a Mitch McConnell say, the only thing that's important for me is to make sure Obama is a one-term president. That's crazy. There's a new chairman of the board, a man called Frank Hackett, sitting in Mr. Ruddy's office on the 20th floor. And when the 12th largest company in the world controls the most awesome goddamn propaganda force in the whole godless world, who knows what shit will be peddled for truth on this network? So you listen to me. Listen to me. Television is not the truth. Television is a goddamn amusement park. Television is a circus, a carnival, a traveling troupe of acrobats, storytellers, dancers, singers, jugglers, sideshow freaks, lion tamers, and football players. We're in the boredom killing business. So if you want the truth, go to God. Go to your gurus. Go to yourselves, because that's the only place you're ever going to find any real truth. We deal in illusions, man. None of it is true. But you people sit there day after day, night after night, all ages, colors, creeds. We're all you know. You're beginning to believe the illusions we're spinning here. You're beginning to think that the tube is reality and that your own lives are unreal. You do whatever the tube tells you. You dress like the tube. You ate like the tube. You raise your children like the tube. You even think like the tube. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion. Hi, this is Charles Woods, and you're watching Real Black. In the 80s, you know, there was uh, Live Aid, which was raising money for starving people in Africa, I believe, right? And then there was Hands Across America, which was raising money for the hungry and the homeless in, in the U.S. Sun City. There were, a lot of, there were a lot of issues that artists got behind. We are right, the world. Right, but I'm saying none of them were like, like race issues. Why would you expect trial out of a white man that freed us legally? the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. We didn't get the right, but we had it legally. But his woman, his wife, his daughter, his sister, his mama, didn't get the right to vote till 1920, which means she couldn't serve on the jury. So if she was framed, she couldn't even be part of the jury. Hmm? That's his daddy.